All right, Joe. Well, let's talk about fighting sin. Uh, I want to actually start by taking you back to the 1980s and to one of your favorite places. I'm going to assume it was one of your favorite places. It was one of mine back in the 80s, and that was the local arcade. Did you spend a lot of time at the local arcade? Yeah, I, I spent way too many quarters uh, in machines that didn't give back enough to me. Yes, I can still hear the sound, the sound of a quarter dropping into an arcade machine. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. But if you remember walking around in the 80s and looking at each of those machines, there was one in particular uh, named Galaxian or Galaga was the, another name for it or Space Invaders. You know, there's this yeah. game. And you, you may know what I'm talking about here. It was the one where you're the, the plane or, or spaceship of some sort at the bottom. And then at the top of the screen, there's just these rows of aliens, I guess, that are slowly making their way down towards you. And your job as the plane is to go side to side, side to side and shoot. You can only do one laser at a time because the software was not great. But, right. but one laser at a time trying to pick off these aliens as the waves of aliens came row by row at you trying to get to you. And uh, it was, man, I, I spent too many hours playing that game, just side to side, going, shooting, trying not to let these aliens get to me. Uh, but it's funny if you have one of your kids play this game. I had this uh, happen to me a few months ago where me and my kids came across one of these arcades and they played and they were super frustrated by the fact that in this game, they're like, dad. Why can't I move forward in this spaceship? Why won't my plane go forward? It only goes side to side. I shot a hole through this line of aliens. Why can't I just fly through them and get out of here? Uh, their, their imagination and everything with these games is obviously so much bigger than what we had available to us in the 80s. But that, that, uh, that made me think of a lot of times my posture and how I feel in the day to day in this battle against sin. That sometimes I feel like I, I hate, have these waves of sin coming at me. And at my best, at my best, I'm shooting side to side, one and then another, and the waves just keep coming. And maybe I can get pick one off, pick another off, but the waves just keep on, keep on coming. Is this my, my plot? Is this all I have to do is at the very best, one laser at a time, you know, just, just one no, as we identified last week, play strong defense, man, just say a, a quick no. Is that the best we can do? Hmm. Well, I, I, I appreciate that image of a, a unrelenting, uh, you know, just battlefield. I think that is the experience of so many guys um, that it does just feel like it's unending and I think it's exhausting. And I think that's one reason why we, we tend to sometimes give up on this fight. Um, but yeah, when it comes to that question, is all we're meant to do uh, play defense and just sit back and let sin come to us. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to realize that that's a, that's a failing strategy. I mean, anytime mm -hmm. you have an aggressive enemy um, to just sit back and let them take the offensive, to let them choose the battlefield and to be content in that defensive posture, you know, that's a fool's strategy. And yet, honestly, um, if I look back on most of my life, and if I, if I look around at the guys, you know, I, I know that's where, that's where we are, you know, um, at best we're playing defense. Sometimes we're not even doing that, Yeah. but then that question, okay, wait, I can aggressively actually play offense. That's a thought that I don't think a lot of men have even had. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that is, and that's our, that's our rule for today. We're just going to jump right into it because this, I, I think will be a mind change for a lot of guys that you can not just play defense. But one of the rules of war is you've got to play even stronger offense. There is offense in attack mode when we start talking about fighting sin. But what does that look like? What, is it, what would it look like for me to play offense in my day to day? Well, we can start with what it doesn't look like. Yeah, that that's is, good. Uh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't look like uh, policing sin. So, mm. I mean, if you think about the, what the police are meant to do in any town or city, is uh, they're just called to keep evil in check. Um, hmm. it would, it's not the job of the police to search your house without a warrant and just you know, invade your space and eradicate whatever is in your life that's maybe uh, not right. Um, you know, it's only if evil breaks out into a public sphere that the policeman comes in and does something about it. And uh, I think that's the attitude we have with a lot of sin. Um, it's okay in the corners. It's okay if it's not reaping any real destruction. 
it's only if it transgresses certain limits that, okay, now I have to deal with it. Now my lust is a problem because it's affecting my relationship with my wife. Now, if I'm happy with my wife and there's a little bit of lust, that's okay. You know, that's, that's the kind of mindset. So uh, when we're talking about playing offense, it's not policing. It's mm. actually going and doing what Paul talks about when he says, put it to death. Um, mm. That's what needs to happen. Mm, that's good. So what do we have at our disposal then as we start to put to death? If Paul tells us we can do this, put to death, how, what do we have at our disposal to do that? Yeah. You know, honestly, I think the, the first key move uh, is to just read the next verse that we talked about last week. Hmm. Um, so last week, in terms of talking about defense, we talked about uh, Romans 6, where Paul says, do not let you know, these, these passions reign. Um, and right after that, what he says, I'm just going to read this. This is a uh, verse 13. He says, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Hmm. Now that's a mouthful. Um, but I think we can break that down in a way that guys can see there's something really powerful in, uh, like you said, a mind shift within this verse. And, uh, one of the things to see initially is so Paul says to present your members as instruments of righteousness. And what's so interesting is that word instrument, I'm going to be a nerd here. And I'm just going to, you know, give you, give you a little extra information. Do it. Come on. The, the Greek word is, is hopla, which is connected to hoplite. Now a hoplite was a soldier, an infantryman in that same word hopla, it can mean weapon. So Paul actually says, present your members as weapons of righteousness. Um, so, you know, there he's saying that we've got something that God has given us that can be used as a weapon against sin. And that's what we're meant to do. Take these members, mm. present them as weapons. And so that then leads to the next question was, what are these members that we're supposed to present, you know, to God as weapons of righteousness? And this is, this is where guys need to just listen. They need to think for just a second, because when Paul's talking about the members we have, that we're meant to wield as weapons. He's not just referring to your, you know, your arms and your legs, like physical members. He's saying your whole person, hmm. all that God has given you, you need to take that and cultivate it such that it's a weapon to fight against sin with. And so we've got to think about, okay, our imagination, that's meant to be a weapon of righteousness. Our memory is meant to be a weapon. You know, our intellect, hmm. um, our attention, all of these, these, you know, things that make us who we are, we need to not just preserve them from sin, but figure out how to make them into a weapon to fight against sin with. And that's what I think is so powerful about that verse. Yeah, especially when you explain it that way, because, yeah, I'll be honest, on my first reading of that, when I hear members, I, uh, yeah, I think immediately of my physical body parts. I think physically, what can I do with these? What, what do I do with my hands, my arms, my feet, you know, is it just the way that I carry myself, posture myself even? Uh, but that makes it so much more all-encompassing when you start talking about my imagination, when you start talking about uh, all of that, that, my attention, the way I, what that's part of these members that's supposed to be used as a weapon of righteousness. Uh, but of course it does lead to then that, uh, the next follow-up question, because here I know how to work out and get better with my hands. Joe. Like I got some someone right. back in this messy garage behind me. I've got like a boxing bag, right? And I can, I can hit that, I can get better. I can, you know, uh, work up that weapon, right? Uh, but how do I do that with my attention or with my intellect or with my imagination, these other members that are supposed to be weapons of righteousness? Yeah. Uh, so, so let's just take a couple. Uh, l l let's start with your imagination. I mean, honestly, rare is the guy who's thought about how to train his imagination, right? We just, uh, yeah. we know we've got one when you're a child, you draw pictures, but you know, you're a man who imagines, uh, you know, if you're a man. Um, and yet we all know we daydream an awful lot. We know a lot in our daydream is not particularly wholesome. And so, I mean, just think of how we typically uh, feed our imagination. Hmm. You know, take a billboard um, that has a, a picture of a woman that has been carefully crafted to make this woman into something to be consumed um, for lust. I mean, that's the whole presentation. This is a sex object, as we talk about. Um, and what we tend to do is just very passively, we just take all this stuff in. 
you know, from Netflix, you know, from billboards. Um, and that is shaping our, our perspective on uh, something like, well, what is a woman? Um, mm. And what is sex? Well, what does it mean then, instead of passively just to feed off what the world offers us, to proactively pursue a different vision? Mm. So how do you, uh, how do you reimagine uh, what a woman is? Uh, how do you reimagine what sex is? Um, you know, to do that sort of thing, you're going to have to um, watch different program. You're going to have to read different books. You're going to have to um, think more deeply about these things. You're going to have to actually choose what you're feeding your imagination and not just let it be shaped passively, um, you know, by the world around us. So, you know, that's, that's the sort of thing I think with say the imagination that we've got to be thinking about. Yeah, that's good. I, uh, I may have told you this at, at some point, you know, it's one of my life goals when I grow up, I want to be Amish. Like that's, that's one of my, don't, <laughs> don't make fun of my life goals here, Joe. This is, I want to be Amish. I love the Amish community. There's their lifestyle and everything. Uh, but the, one of the things I love about the Amish is they've just become really good at saying no, right. They just say right. no to everything. Cars. No electricity. <laughs> no, they just, they just say no to everything, which is very attractive to me. Uh, not so attractive to my family. I don't think I'm ever going to achieve that life goal. Uh, but I think that I, as I was looking at uh, how that has affected my life, even, and how, how I think about the things around me, I have adopted that same attitude towards things like TV or even specific types of entertainment. It's easy, I think, to just go hardcore defense and just say no, 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 no. Uh, but I think I've missed opportunities in my life to use some of that and say, I can say yes in specific ways that will build my intellect that will build my attention, that there, there are ways to say yes to things that are actually helpful in sharpening a weapon. So for me, it's taking even simple things like, all right, don't just say, if I just say I'm going to cut out all TV in my life forever, that's, right. and I'm not saying that's a bad idea. It could be a good idea. It's probably not practical though. So what if I say, okay, TV can be a good thing, but I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose what to watch. I'm going to think through it, actually. And is this something that's going to build me? Is it a weapon? Uh, is this going to build my weapon? Or is this going to get me in a, a state of mind that's just tearing things down? So uh, I think even just realizing that we can take a moment and you know go through your list of podcasts and say, is this right. helping me build a weapon of righteousness or not? And we can choose, I'm going to spend my time and energy consuming these things or not. That, that's been a helpful way for me to say, Here's how I sharpen my weapon. Yeah. And, you know, so an, another example would be, uh, you know, shifting from imagination to say, say go, to, go to that weapon of your memory. Um, mm. You know, God's given us a memory. And a lot of what we do is we tell a story and we interpret the past with our memory. We do it all the time. And there's a way in which you can wield your memory as an instrument of sin. Uh, you can. So, for example, maybe it's your relationship with your father. You can choose to tell the story of who he is and highlight all the, the things he did wrong. And that's going to feed anger. It's going to feed wrath and bitterness um, in your heart. There's another way to tell the story. Um, you know, there's a way of, of looking back and giving thanks to God for the things that are so easy to take for granted. Hmm. The fact that, you know, you had clothes on your back, that he went into work every day, you know, so he could provide for you. Maybe he wasn't as emotionally attuned as you would like, but truth be told, he was sweating and working hard so that you could, you know, have the childhood that you enjoyed. And, um, you know, there's a way of telling that story with grace and with forgiveness that doesn't feed that anger, but actually feeds appreciation and love for him and that recognition. He's a broken person just like you are. And so how do you, you know, how do you tell the story of relationships such that it promotes the character God wants us to be putting on and, you know, pushes against the passions that he wants us to put off. And that's another example, I think, of wielding a, a member as a weapon of righteousness. Yeah. And you, you cued to a very uh, helpful phrasing there. You said putting off and putting on, you know, recalling that language from Paul. We talked about last week, you know, the, that list of things we're supposed to put off. You know, he, he was very specific in all the things we're supposed to put off, but it didn't stop there. Right. It's right. all right. Once you put something off it's not just emptiness. It's put on then. Now he talks about putting yeah. on kindness and meekness and all that. So 
how does that then play in for, for guys? Because we're not just called put all these things off, but pursue something. There's some virtue to be pursued, right? Yeah. And I think that's, you know, we just have to realize there's never a vacuum in the heart that if you want to take something out, something has to fill it. And uh, this is where, again, that, that whole, like you said, just to say no is not enough. It's not enough to say, okay, I'm always going to look away at beautiful women. Um, ultimately, you've got to realize, how do I look at women without wanting to consume them? I mean, you've got to actually be able to you know, appreciate their dignity. And that's true with you know, any of the, the kind of virtues. What is it that we're meant to put on? Most guys do not have a clue. Um, you know, if we ask, for example, what's the opposite of envy? We know envy is wrong. You know, I know that every time I go on social media, it fills my heart with discontentment. Well, what should I have? And that's where, okay, well, you need an actual image of contentment. Like, what does it look like to take the life you have and say, God, this is good. This is who you've made me to be. And um, to actually pursue, like Paul, the ability, as he talks about in Philippians, to be content in any set of circumstances. Um, so that's just, yeah, Paul's saying there's something positive to be grabbed hold of. As you grab hold of these things that are good, you're going to find the grip of the evil is going to be diminished in your life. Yes. Yeah. It's such a difficult, I think it raises the bar here in a, in a good way though, because you talk to a guy whose default position towards his kids is anger. Like you just, even the thought of the sound of your, your kids, when you come home from work, it's just, it can stir up anger. It's one thing to tell him you need to put an end to that anger. You need to say, no, you need to, you need to stop that. That in and of itself is hard when you've got deep seated anger issues, but then to tell a guy, you need to walk into your home with compassion. That's, that, that should be your aim. Yeah. Walk into your home to, and aim compassion towards your kids. Aim kindness. Yeah. That's picking up a whole different weapon as you walk into your home. But that's the standard that's set before us, right? Not just put off. Don't just not be angry. <laughs> right. That's not right. enough, right? We've right. got something to put on as well. Um, yeah, I, I want to take a, a, a few minutes now to look at a specific sin and say, how do we do this with something that guys are actually struggling with? So let's talk about sloth, which is a word that we've probably heard tossed around a lot and probably don't even know what it really means. So give me a definition of sloth that we can work with as we try to identify some ways to, to, to work against it. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, sloth, it, it's more than sluggishness. Um, it's more then laziness. We all know that feeling. We all know that that sense, okay, I should be reading my Bible or whatever, and I just don't have the motivation. But really, if we want to diagnose, well, what is sloth as a sinful passion? Uh, I think the best definition I can think of is it's boredom with God. It's uh, being uninterested in what is ultimately interesting, you know, of have utmost interest, God himself it's being unmotivated to the, the things that we should be most inspired to be doing. And, um, you know, as if we think about the fact that, you know, God has created a world that in some way um, reveals his glory. You know, he's revealed his, himself through Jesus, and we have access to uh, the life of Jesus in the scriptures. And yet when, when all of this stuff, all of this revelation of divine glory that the angels never tire of, you know, beholding, you know, we just wake up and think, ah, I'm not interested. You know, that signifies there's something not good in our heart. And that's what we're trying to diagnose as a sloth. Yeah. Uh, I would love to say that that sounds so terrible that I've never <laughs> been there, Joe. That that couldn't be in my life. To, to, not, to be bored with God. How could you be bored with God? I would love to, to sit here and tell you that that's never been an issue in my life, but it totally has. Uh, even in the past couple of years, I came to a point where just talking to some friends, like, guys, I think I've realized I am not enamored with God. This is just, yeah. and it, there was complacency and stuff in my life. And it all, as I dug into it, found its root in, I'm just not that impressed by God. And that was a crazy thought to come to, right? Because it is crazy. Like you said, that this is the God who created, the God who has transformed my life. And yet I wake up and just like, eh, that's, that's insanity, right? <laughs> but that's yeah. why we've, we got to see this is sloth. This is a sin that we've got to go to battle against. We've got to do, there's yeah. defense and both offense to be played here. 
Um, how would you say, how would you help a guy walk through and battle against sloth? Yeah. Well, step one, I think is to realize it's, it's not a small, it's not insignificant. The, the temptation is like, we know, uh, we know anger can be a real threat to, uh, the, the, the relationships we cherish. We know lust can lead to all kinds of destructive behavior. Sloth is kind of like, well, what's the big deal? Um, but I think what guys need to realize, first of all, is just, this is a gateway sin. When your soul is empty of what should satisfy you, that's what opens your heart up to whether it's gluttony, whether it's, uh, you know, pornography, um, all kinds of other things are rushing in to fill what should be filled by God. And so when you realize that, first of all, the first step is just to realize it's worth fighting, because I think a lot of guys don't really think it is. Um, I think at the point you do realize it's a problem, what's really important is, um, first of all, to avoid the kind of instant fixes. So, okay, you're feeling empty. Well, what's the temptation? Well, get the dopamine hit from just scrolling, you know, your, your social media feed. That's, that's putting a plaster over a broken arm. Like, you know, don't just watch TV. If your soul is dry and empty, um, as, as counterintuitive as it may be, I think what guys need to hear is these moments when uh, the Bible just feels arid and prayer feels like you're just speaking into a, you know, an echo chamber, these aren't moments to give up. They're the moments to double down on the basic spiritual disciplines and uh, to realize that, um, that these, are the, these are the sort of channels that God uses to fill us. And often, you know, it's only as we are faithful in going through the motions, and it just feels like going through the motions that suddenly we get surprised mm -hmm. and something sparks and, you know, the, the, the sort of passion begins to fire up again. But if you're not doing the basic things, that spark's not going to actually ignite. Yeah, that's, that is true. And a personal testimony can tell you, yeah, uh, if you're not doing those regular discipline things, uh, you're missing out on an opportunity to fight against this. One thing I have done in my own personal life to fight against sloth, uh, specifically when I was really dealing with this uh, this past year, is I decided, yes, A, double down on spiritual disciplines. I was going to memorize some scripture. But B, I thought, what if I surrounded myself, just, just started rubbing shoulders with someone who is just amazed with God, just like you, you get around them. They are just nothing but amazed by God. I need that person in my life. I need them to rub off on me. And there's in my mind, no one better than David, right? King David in the Psalms. He just, Oh, just gushes and flows. Right. And like, it's just kind of annoying at times the language he uses. But uh, so I, me and my friends took some time to memorize Psalm 145. And what it did for me is it reignited my language of the glory of God. And what I'd realized I lost in my slothfulness is even just the simple language of recognizing who God is and how grand and great he is. And so just rubbing shoulders with David and hearing his language, it rubbed off on me and using the discipline to, to memorize that, it then became a part of my morning routine to say these amazing things about God to God. And that, that really got me kind of through that hump. Now, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say, I no longer struggle with sloth at all. You know, I'm no longer bored. But man, it's helped. Uh, it's helped a lot. I don't know. Do you have anything in your personal life you would point to that say, this is how you battle sloth. This is how you move forward. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, Psalm 145 is such a great place to go. One of the lines I love in there is, you know, is that line, great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Yes. And the way these things are connected, like God is actually great. Like this is, this is what's so bizarre about sloth. Um, you know, a lot of preachers have used the illustration of the Grand Canyon, the way you just can't be bored if you're on the edge looking out at the canyon. Mm. And God is so much greater than the Grand Canyon. He's so much greater than the universe. There's no lack of greatness. And what I love about the psalmist is, you know, that praising him greatly is dependent upon the vision of his greatness. Mm. And so the, you know, the more we're able to see of him, the response of the heart is going to be the sort of passion that we long for. And so, you know, the, just that, that the question is, how do you get yourself in that place where you're most likely to catch a glimpse of his greatness? It just takes a glimpse. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's no, I can't give a formula because God reveals himself. I mean, he, he's the one, I mean, he's a person, he's a living God. So, um, but you put yourself in that spot where he's most likely to speak. And this is, you know, with your Bible open, 
This is on your knees in prayer. This is in fellowship with other Christians. You know, this is at communion, you know, in the midst of worship. Like these are the places he loves to show up. So put yourself there and uh, just cry out. And he's, yes. he's going to show up in his time and his way. Yes. Yes. So I, guys, if there's anything we can tell you this week, do this. Like I, I follow through on the disciplines that you've outlined that you actually think will lead to growth and change in your life. And along the way, I think we're going to start to see battles won with sin. Uh, so let me just say, guys, our hope in this podcast and the ones to come is not that you will just put off, that you will just stop being angry. This is not, we're trying to not give you a formula for, hey, here's how to free yourself of lust. We want you to pursue a life of holiness. We want to help you get on that path. And so we hope you see not only yourself playing strong defense, but even stronger offense. If you need help with that, we've got resources available. You can go to survivingthetrenches.men and you can plug in with not only uh, Joe's book that outlines even more than we can cover here in this podcast on how to fight sin, uh, but also you find a 10-week challenge that you can do with your friends, uh, a way to engage some of these disciplines and get on that track of being on the offense when it comes to fighting sin. So y'all go and check that out and then join us again next week for another episode.